Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Deep Fat Fried. Um, so uh, I wanted to start by uh, complaining uh, about uh, <laughs> shocking. Yeah, that's, that's shocking to me. I know, right? Uh, so I saw uh, this guy on our last uh, episode that we made public. I think it was the or it wasn't public. It was actually behind a patron uh, paywall, which kind of makes this even more annoying to me. Um, it was the uh, top 10 animated uh, movies. And uh, yep. there was someone that was like, yeah, nice job on the new set you guys are building. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a uh, global pandemic happening right now. Yeah. So that's the reason we're not on the new set, because actually uh, we worked pretty hard to get the new set ready. And then just as it was ready to go, there happened to be uh, this thing called COVID-19 that uh, has, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but reshaped the nature of our society for the time being. And uh, I actually haven't seen Scotty or Paul in person for like uh, a month now or something like that. So uh, sorry, bro. Never, never co- Corona. Beer? So, so I mean, it hasn't I'm, quite been a month yet, but yeah, well, it's been a while. And I mean, you know, in on it. yeah, I mean, it's fucking, uh, you know, I've been totally isolated as I know many people are dealing with that right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, like the, the new set is, is, I mean, it's up and ready to go. I mean, everything is, that needs to be there is there. I mean, there's some lighting stuff that still needs to happen, but, uh, we have the lights purchased and, uh, we have the people who know, have the know how to set them up. But, uh, unfortunately, you know, we're kind yeah, of in a, we're talking about their safety and our safety and everyone else's safety. You know, we can't just fucking go, Oh, who cares about a pandemic? <laughs> What's a little pandemic? Huh? No big deal. Um, so yeah, uh, obviously we're waiting to see what happens with that. Um, but, uh, you know, we do have a new set built and I'm hoping that, you know, we'll, get, we'll get a chance to use it. Uh, but you know, I don't, I don't fucking know at this point, there's just so much, uh, everything is steeped in so much uncertainty, but no one wants to, I don't want this, you know, to be the thing, but I mean, just don't be a fucking prick is all I'm asking, you know, which I know you guys can't, I, I know some people, they just can't help but be pricks. But, the fact uh, that you even asked that is going to encourage more people to be pricks. Well, they can go fuck themselves. It's best to just allow stupid opinions to exist in their own little vacuum. I found. I suppose you're probably right. Uh, maybe one day I'll be wise. I'll be wise enough to uh, figure that out. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. That's a great episode. That's from season two. Um, uh, I think it was actually episode two of season two, if I'm not mistaken. It's called uh, Bart. I thought it was a all you were saying, though. It was called Bart the Genius, uh, and it's where Bart uh, switches test results with Martin Prince, and uh, and uh, smartest kid. People think he's a genius for a brief duration of time. Of course, he cannot keep the charade going. Um, but uh, you know, this is uh, this episode is about the Simpsons. I guess we can get right into it. Um, this is the longest running American sitcom. In history. Yes. The longest running American sitcom. I don't know if there, there, I suppose there must be a sitcom somewhere else that uh, from some other country that's run longer. I don't know what it is, but as far as American sitcoms go, longest running. Uh, also the longest running uh, American scripted primetime TV series, period. Uh, 34 is the number of primetime Emmys that this show has garnered. Uh, also won 34 Annie Awards. It's also won a Peabody Award. It's been on the air for 31 years, uh, 33 if you count uh, the Tracy Ullman show shorts, which I don't see why you wouldn't. I think also the most guest spots. Ever uh, yes, uh, actually, I think, um, yeah, by like a, a tremendous margin. Like the Simpsons kind of, uh, uh, especially now, is, is basically exist to do celebrity guest spots. Um, so there was, uh, let's just talk about the sheer magnitude of the the value, the monetary value of this fucking property. Um, I mean, we're t- this this is what the Simpsons makes in a, about a half an hour, you know. Um, so the Simpsons movie was released in two thousand seven, made uh, five hundred thirty six million four hundred fourteen thousand two hundred seventy dollars at the global box office. The following That's year, yeah, it's just what's that, Sky? That's just box office. Not they were all the DVD and Blu-ray oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sales. That's just pure box office results. Uh, so the and this is for something that people, you know, can watch on TV for fucking free. You know, this isn't usually when they make a cash-in movie based on a TV show. It doesn't 
That's usually not a recipe for huge, you know, success, but for over half a billion dollars. <laughs> right. Um, so the following year, 2008, Simpsons merchandise made seven hundred and fifty million dollars globally. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, this merchandise includes things like Simpsons DVDs, Simpsons T-shirts, Simpsons action figures. Uh, there was some Simpsons Legos. There's Simpsons board games, including things like Simpsons Monopoly. They have do you, Simpsons. Do you, you know one that I remember. Yeah, and I was I was a little like it's it's shocking to me to think that this has been on the air for 34 years. Was, uh, at the time we're filming this, I'm going to be 40 in a couple of days. Right. Which means for the balance of my life, this has been a thing. Yes. And I had, a, and it was wildly popular, a Simpsons uh, music album. Yeah, they've actually put out several. Um, there was a number one, I believe, hit called Do the Bartman. Yep. In the early I had 90s. that album. It, the, I didn't like the Do the Bartman song, but there's a song called Deep, Deep Trouble on that on that album that i can still to this day now i haven't heard it since i was probably eight years old and i could probably rap most it was it was a bart simpson rap song yeah i gotcha uh they got card games they got video games they got novelty items uh books comic books i mean just any arcade game yeah the simpsons arcade game was awesome uh back in the day we used to play that at the uh, bowling alley that we used to go to as kids Uh, dude i love that fucking game Uh, it was never ported for any sort of uh home console at least uh, you know what last i checked um but yeah this this simpsons shit i mean like it's it it, you know it it, it's like kind of on the level of like a star wars sort of thing where it's just like you could slap the simpsons on fucking anything it's yeah, this is the first show as like a kid that I truly was like obsessed with. Like, oh my god, I gotta watch some. I love the Simpsons. I love the Simpsons. Like, I always wanted to see the Simpsons. It was like the first time I actually came passionate about a television series. Right, and uh, it, I think a lot of people, probably especially in our age range, kind of have had that experience. I remember mom uh, when I was a little kid. You know, uh, out of fucking the wild blue yonder, she's like, "You are not allowed to watch that show, The Simpsons." <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. I know Why? it's a it's a cartoon, but you're not allowed to watch it. It's a bad cartoon. It teaches bad values or whatever the fuck. And of course, I was like, I gotta watch this fucking show. <laughs> yeah. Like, of there course. was no, there could have been no more effective advertisement than that. And I mean, like, it's it's hard to fucking imagine now that The Simpsons was at one point a controversial uh, television show, but it was. <laughs> Subversive show, dude. It really was back in the early seasons of The Simpsons. It was viewed as subversive, like the way people view South Park and you know Family Guy when it first launched. You know, and like these, like Rick and Morty, like it had that subversive tone around. It had that kind of like cool vibe. It wasn't well, just like all of those shows owe their existence to The Simpsons. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, like when we'll talk about it a little bit later, just the crazy like influence of the show. But um, let's continue on with just like some of the fucking gigantic cultural impact. Here's a fucking. Not many, th- not many TV shows rise to the level of like we're going to mint stamps now. Because in 2009, the U.S. Postal Service put out uh, the Simpsons a uh, series of 44 cent stamps. Uh, over a billion of these stamps were minted. Um, there's also a Simpsons section at Universal Studios Florida, which includes a pretty decent uh, Simpsons ride. It's a good ride. These uh, these stamps are uh, oddly poorly drawn. Well, that's because Matt Groening actually drew them. Oh, okay. This Got is it. this is his. Uh, this is about how well Matt Groening can actually draw. So <laughs> that's uh, that's why you see the uh, the 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 poorness, I guess, of the uh, of the art compared to like what you'd see on the TV show. I think the kids look okay, but the parents look oddly bad. Yeah, especially Homer. <laughs> yeah, Homer <laughs> looks like a total retard. Homer dude. looks like, like Homer looks basically like he has Down paper. syndrome or something. Um. <laughs> So uh, the Simpsons is uh, basically a fucking empire. Um, there's no, you know, and it's no longer its height, uh, its popularity, as we'll see a little bit later. But it still prints fucking money, and it's probably going to continue to print money even after the TV show comes to an end, because the TV show is not really like that's like kind of the core of you know keeping the Simpsons out there in the zeitgeist, I guess. But I mean, like, it's kind of like uh, attained that Mickey Mouse level status. Like, there's not a bunch of new Mickey Mouse cartoons coming out, but you could still sell the shit out of Mickey Mouse merchandise. And the Simpsons have kind of reached that level where even if the show is canceled tomorrow, it's going to continue to fucking rake in money 
you know, for for decades to come. Sure. Um, now it's it's the success of the show is such that its creator, um, Matt Groening, has a net worth of. Would you guys like to venture a guess? He's uh, got to be like in the hundreds of millions. He's got to be in the high end of hundreds of millions. I'd say like six hundred, seven hundred million dollars. I'm gonna go with one point two billion. <laughs> well, Paul is right. Uh, he actually is. You actually were exactly right, Paul. Six hundred million dollars is his net worth. Wow. Um, the show is so fucking popular. Let's just take a look at some of the vo- uh, the voice actors' net worths here. And th- these are the ones that are kind of shocking to me. This is Tress McNeil, who uh, has just worked as a voice actor on The Sims, but doesn't doesn't really voice many super popular characters voices Agnes Skinner and like the crazy cat lady and like a bunch of like really peripheral characters, but still has a net worth of $10 million. That's the, gotta be at the like low end. Yeah. The person who voices the cat and dog has a net worth of $15 million. <laughs> oh, Jesus dude, Christ. Give me this fucking gig, dude. I'll voice a cat. Ruff, I don't give a shit. You know, <laughs> give me my, give me my 15 million bucks, please. <laughs> exactly. Um, Pamela Hayden, uh, oh, twenty five million, voices uh, uh, Millhouse, I guess. And uh, I didn't know Millhouse's uh, voice actor was a chick. Yeah, actually, a lot of the uh, I know most of the uh, most of the uh, children are voiced by women, whether they're male or female. That's very common in animation. Uh, Todd Flanders, Miss Springfield, Rod Flanders, and of course Millhouse. Uh, Julie Kavner voices Marge has a net worth of fifty million. Even though she can't do the voice anymore. Yep. Uh, and I think that's fair to say. And we're actually going to take a look at that in a minute here. Uh, Nancy Cartwright, uh, who voices Bart Simpson, uh, as well as some other uh, characters, 60 million. Yeah, but you know, Bart's, but Bart's a really big fucking character. Oh, though, yeah. So I, I can understand that one a little bit more. Nancy oh, yeah. Cartwright's also a huge Scientologist, too. I didn't know <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey Grammer, who, I mean, he made a lot of his money outside of The I Simpsons. Mean, yeah. So. But uh, uh, Harry Shearer, who uh, voices a ton of Simpsons characters, um, about worth, worth about sixty-five million. Um, Dan Castellaneta, who voices Homer Simpson, worth about seventy-five million. Also voices a bunch of other characters: uh, uh, Barney Gumble, Krusty the Clown, and a bunch of others as well. Uh, Hank Azaria. It's kind of weird. Another guy that gets a lot of work outside the Simpsons too. Um. Hank Azaria makes uh, about three hundred thousand dollars an episode. Um, get up oh about man, eighty million dollars. Yearly Smith, who voices Lisa Simpson, oddly the richest on uh, the list, uh, with a net worth of about eighty-five million. She must make some good investments. <laughs> so I mean, we have a uh, you know th- this. A lot of people have gotten rich off of this show. It's kind of the point here. It's it's close to a billion dollars of net worth just in the principal cast. Yes, and in uh, you know, especially when you tabulate in Matt Groening and shit. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, and you know, we don't know what the we don't know the salaries of like the producers and the fucking showrunner Al Jean and all these other people. But um, yeah, The Simpsons in its thirtieth season, um, hit an all times ratings low. And it hit it at a really. It, it didn't just hit it on an ordinary episode either. It hit it on the th- the season finale of the thirtieth season was the lowest ratings in Simpsons history, uh, uh-huh. ranking in uh, only uh, one point forty four million viewers. Uh, Damn. And that pr- and it also performed dismally in the eighteen to forty nine demographic. Um. So season thirty one is currently underway. Season thirty two has been greenlit, uh, but no one knows if the show will uh, continue beyond season 32. Um, And I think a lot of people probably feel that it probably shouldn't, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, The Simpsons have other problems as well, though. Uh, For instance, uh, its voice actors are getting pretty old. This is uh, Marcia Wallace, the voice of Edna Krabappel, who uh, died in 2013 at the age of 70. Not a spring chicken. Nope. Uh, Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson, of Grandpa Simpson, of Barney Gumble, of Krusty the Clown, Sideshow Mel, Groundskeeper Willie, Mayor Quimby, Hans Molman, and others, is uh, sixty-two. So I mean, is it? I mean, it's it's maybe realistic for him to do that a few more years, but I mean, like, you know, in ten years he's gonna be seventy-two. <laughs> 
in up there. 20 years, he's going to be 82 if he's still alive. Um, Harry Shearer uh, is 76. Damn. He's the voice of Mr. Burns, of Waylon Smithers, of Principal Skinner, of Ned Flanders, of Reverend Lovejoy, of Kent Brockman, of Dr. Hibbert. I mean, yeah, they got to start thinking pretty soon. I mean, and, the Simpsons can't go on much longer. I mean, if he's 76, I mean, they, they should, well, for fuck's sake, he was in his 30s. He's like my age when they started doing this shit. Pretty much. Right. And, uh, and he basically, he almost left the show already back in 2015. And uh, by the way, Harry Shearer, uh, I didn't put this in my research, but it's just kind of a fact that um, he has not been satisfied with the quality of the show for decades. Like he's right there with the fans saying like, this kind of sucks now, but I mean, obviously he still likes that paycheck. So I was going to say, he doesn't have a problem taking that to the bank. No, I mean, he's but. pretty, he's pretty upfront about it. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this for a paycheck at this point. I don't really I know for the money. Come on. I mean, yeah, he's, he's not, he's not under any illusion that what he's making is, is all that well, great anymore. I mean, if someone's going to cut you a check for three or $400,000 to go to a sound booth and record some voices, which you can do in your fucking sleep at this point, you're going to say yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, it's not like it's a stressful job. Like, all right. Uh, do, do Smithers a little bit different. Or do Mr. Burton's a little differently this time. I mean, come on. It's these guys can everyone involved in this cast. It's probably it's probably just like nothing to them to do the job at this point. Yeah. Uh, so um, Julie, the top of Julie Kavner's head here. Um, Julie Kavner is the voice of Marge Simpson, as well as Patty and Selma. Uh, she is 69. About a year shy of when um, uh, the the Edna Karapal voice actress died. Oh, shit, dude. Um, also, I think it's completely fair at this point to say that she has lost her ability to do this voice. Um, I already showed this to you guys, I think, in an episode of The Grease Trap. But I'll play it again here because uh, I think you need to see. You need to be reminded of just how bad Probably. this has gotten. And if you're just obviously just listening, then, you know, you can really hear the difference. At any rate, I believe you. And I think you should go outside and straighten this out. Some of their chants are very catchy and memorable. Oh, that's okay. 94. That was 94. This is 2017. And it has it has not improved since then. Okay, that's enough for now. Jeez, come on. Don't make me put you under warm water. Sounds like she needs a glass of warm water. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just natural aging. There's just no way to really prevent that. I mean, she's she's starting to get the old lady voice. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> it's like Carrie Fisher. You know, we last saw Carrie Fisher in Return of the Jedi. Then hey there, voice. Luke, it's me, your sister Leia. <laughs> <laughs> Leia. You're like, what the fuck happened? I'm a princess. <laughs> I mean, it's not as bad as pronounced as this difference, but you can definitely hear she's really struggling to maintain. I'll tell you what. Um, I was watching... Uh, I just I wanted to see how other people in the voice cast were holding up. I didn't pull a clip of it because it wasn't quite bad enough yet to have that sort of drastic like, oh, my God. But um, I was listening to some of this, the the voice work from season like 30. And uh, I got to say, like, you can you can kind of hear the old man creeping into home, the Homer voice, too. Yeah, like it hasn't. It's quite, not shocking. It hasn't gotten there quite yet, as to the same extent it is in uh, Julie Kavner's vocal performance. But Dan Castellaneta's uh, Homer is is kind of starting to sound a little bit more like Abraham, you know. Ah. Yeah. Um. So there's Yeardley Smith here. She's 55, so she you know she could probably still keep doing it for a while. Um. But you know when people talk about the uh. I'm sorry, this is Yeardley Smith. This is, uh, who is this? This is Nancy Cartwright. Yeah. Uh, she's 62. Uh, Yeardley Smith is 55. So they're, they're both somewhat reasonably still. And plus they're doing a, uh, you know, more of a, a f- totally put on voice. Um, but, you know, when people talk about the decline of The Simpsons, they're not usually talking about uh, the, the diminishing ratings or the aging cast. Because the fact of the matter is that even though the ratings have gone down, you know, the, t- the 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 very concept of how people watch a TV show has pretty dramatically changed. You know, uh, there's not too many people that are sitting plopping down on the couch and turning on the old boob tube anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like at the, at the same time every week, you know what I mean? 830, it's time for the Simpsons. That <laughs> that type of TV watching is right. pretty much confined to old people now. Yeah. So, or I mean, like. Event. There's not a lot of people that are tuning in for that kind of shit, like, you know, especially not something like The Simpsons. It's been around forever. Um, Now the impetus has to be live. But I will say this, you know, 
despite all these things you, you've said, I mean, Fox is still putting a ton of money behind promoting. Well, the I mean, Simpsons. if you look at the ratings of The Simpsons compared to other Fox shows, it usually beats every other show they put out on the night they put it out. So, I mean, um, and I mean, look, it, it's all about dollars and cents. As long as they right. want, as long as it makes sense financially, they're not going to stop doing it. And we don't really know how many people are watching The Simpsons uh, digitally on. You know, obviously, it's on Disney Plus at this point. It's on it's uh, Hulu. Very prominent placement there. Like when I went to go watch the episode you recommended, uh, not really recommended for that, but just but just for research, like it was one of the most. It was featured prominently on Disney Plus. So. Oh, well, I mean, of course. I mean, it's such a valuable property. Um, so, but you know, the ratings, uh, you know, while they're they're nowhere near their peak, and in fact, they've declined quite significantly. I mean, like the way people have watched television has changed, so you got to factor stuff like that in. And usually, the ratings are pretty good, considering um, you know that, that they hit that low point of one point forty four million. It seems like they average more around three, uh, which is usually more than is than people that are watching any other show on Fox, at least on live television. Um, uh, you know, and the voice cast, you know. Even ones as culturally indelible as The Simpsons, you can you could change a fucking voice cast. I mean, you know, we could tell our, you know, they could sit there and oh, no one could ever replace. But you know, people can be. Replaced. I don't know if I agree with that. People can be replaced. Like I don't know if I agree with that, dude. All right, go ahead. I, like I, I when make it comes, your case. When it comes to like the main principal cast, yeah, I I would even even not watching The Simpsons in as long as it's been and. Uh, you know, it's probably been since I think I was telling you before the show, like 97 or so that I watched the Simpsons anywhere near religiously. And I probably haven't seen an episode of the Simpsons other than the one that I watched uh, that you recommended for the research of the show. And it, I, I wouldn't be shocked if it's 20 years. Right. Um, it, I would know immediately a bad Homer impersonation. <laughs> yeah. I would know immediately a bad Bart Simpson impersonation. You know what I mean? Like the principal cast, I I really can't see a recasting working. Yeah, but uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. How the fuck do you recast Homer Simpson? I think it could be done. Uh, yeah, I think could it be done. Yeah, but I mean, at that point, I think a lot of people would actually truly feel The Simpsons is dead. I think people already feel that way. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that. that way. But like, if you take out the actual principal voice actors, it's like unless you can get, get someone that can, that can do Homer spot on, you're gonna there's gonna be people going, "Who the fuck is Homer now?" Well, look, when uh, Harry Shearer threatened to leave the show back in 2015, they were not planning on stopping. They were just like, "All right, well, we'll just find different voice actors for those those characters." So, I mean, like obviously they've thought about this contingency. Um, I don't know how long that these motherfuckers are gonna try to keep The Simpsons going, but. If they if they just expect to keep it going in perpetuity, which at this point it kind of seems like maybe they're trying to do, um, eventually they will have to fucking hire new voice actors. Yes. Um, and yeah. I guess at that point we can see how cringy it is or if it actually is acceptable. Um, but, you know, I, no one even watches the show anymore. So um, I guess I can't say no one because some people are still out there doing it. Uh, look, at this is a um, this is what people are really talking about when they talk about the decline of The Simpsons, though. They're talking about something, uh, you know, much more fundamental. They're talking about a show that went from witty to shitty, <laughs> from, uh, you know, kind of like a subversive, you know, I mean, not like super subversive, like, oh, my God, it's trying to destroy America. But it's like it had some edge to it. And now it's basically fucking toothless. Um, it used to have some kind of smart satire. Now it's basically just like devolved into self parody. Um you know, this is a revolutionary show that I think um, left a, an indelible stamp on the cultural zeitgeist. Uh, and now it's kind of just this like obligatory sort of institution of American television. You know, the words I wrote here in my document to kind of describe it were tired, dusty, rote, boring and bland. And this <laughs> this here, this this uh, chart you're looking at here, this is uh, the average uh, IMDB ratings on every episode of The Simpsons uh, through like season twenty eight, and you can see that you can see this like uh, this uh, box here, this kind of gray section. That's sort of what's considered the golden age of The Simpsons, uh, which is what, what like what two through seven. Um, you know, it, it depend. Uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit about the golden age in a minute, but um, this is kind of the this is kind of what's considered the golden age here in this box. And you see that, you know, there was uh, you know, most episodes kind of some of them were you know nine, uh, all the way up to almost nine point five. 
uh, you know, and the lower end kind of hovered around like the the high sevens and eights, uh, and the average seems to be around uh, you know eight and a half points per episode. And these are user ratings, of course. Everyone knows yeah, how IMDb, IMDb works. IMDb. Um, but then you see that uh, you know now it's kind of settled into this uh, plateau region where it gets about like six and a half points per episode on average. You know, occasionally, like a a, a good episode in the zombie uh, era of The Simpsons, uh, you know, maybe gets to like eight point two, eight point three. Usually, about seven. It looks like for the even the even later seasons. Yeah, uh, and you know, like most of these episodes, like you know, they they like a good episode of The Simpsons now for what it is is like oh, it's like a seven. You know, and this is a show that you the people used to be like, oh, that's a nine. I'm looking at this uh this graph here and I'm noticing TJ one that's way down there. Yeah, there is, down. you might notice here uh there's an episode in in uh, season 23 that uh goes way lower than any of the others and we'll talk about that. It's like a 4.3. Um uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Cuz it's not really interesting to talk about the decline unless we talk a little bit about the rise. True. So um, let's start with uh, the story of this guy. This is Matthew Abram Groening. Uh, his name is spelled groaning, but it's pronounced graining. And uh, at some point, I'm probably going to read it as groaning. So uh, here's uh, his high school picture here. And uh, he was born in Portland, Oregon in 1954 to his parents, uh, who are actually named Homer and Marge, by the way. I see. I did not know that. Uh, oh, damn. So in uh, yeah, in 1970, actually, and uh, he has a younger, two younger sisters named uh, Maggie and Lisa as well. Um, and his grandpa's named Abraham. Uh, he so actually he him as Bart. Uh, he, yeah, he, he didn't name Bart after himself. He actually named Bart uh, after an anagram of the word brat. So in 1977, Groening moved to Los Angeles to become a writer. And he worked a series of what he describes as uh, lousy jobs. You know, he bussed tables. He washed dishes at a nursing home, which somehow that's worse than washing dishes in other places. Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, that's the bottom end of dishwasher jobs right there. <laughs> right. Uh, he clerked at a record store. Um, he landscaped at a sewage treatment plant, which once again oh, is the bottom, of, <laughs> that's the bottom of landscaping as well. Man, um, did, was he seeking out the worst possible <laughs> I don't know. jobs within a already bad jobs? Uh, he chauffeured, um, and he did a little bit of ghostwriting. I think he it, it doesn't. Did I, he chauffeur for homeless people? Yeah, I was wondering. If I chauffeur for the the chronically stinky. You know, <laughs> um, he did some ghostwriting for a um, I guess an old western director. Um, it did, I could never I could not figure out who. Uh, but I guess there was uh, he, you know, some old Western uh, director that uh, uh, Matt Groening did some ghostwriting for. Um, he also self-published a comic book called Life in Hell. Um, he uh, made a professional. He was selling. He basically started off selling this comic book out of the record store he worked at, um, and eventually. It's actually actually not that long. It was 1978, so about a year after he moved to L.A., he uh, managed to sell a uh, comic strip professionally to uh, Wet Magazine. Uh, they published a strip entitled uh, Forbidden Words. I looked to see if I could find the strip. I could not. Um, then he got a job at a now-defunct alternative newspaper called The Los Angeles Reader. Uh, when he, he first started working there, he was uh, just a delivery boy. Worked his way up to typesetter. Uh, he did some receptionist work. He answered phones. Uh, then it's he, a pretty inexpensive magazine. Yeah. It's yeah. Zero, 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 zero dollars and that's, zero cents. Yeah. You can't argue with that price. This is one, of those, this one. It's one of those like, you know, you, you come across a bin that has a bunch of these and you can just take one for free, basically. Yeah, freebies. Yeah, it's just, yeah, they make money off advertising, and they put a, they put some advertising in it to to make a little dough. Um, he did some. He finally he got he worked his way up to kind of like being an editor at the publication, and uh, he got in good enough there. And they're like, "Oh, Matt, you're a hard worker. You're a good guy. We're gonna give you. Uh, we're gonna start. You know, 
they he he got to the point where he showed the uh, the uh, you know the editor in chief or or whoever is the fucking in charge the you know his comics and uh, he's like yeah I like these comics that's pretty good uh, so they started uh, actually uh, publishing his comics in the paper on a regular basis uh, and they also gave Matt a weekly music column called Sound Mix. Uh, but uh, Graining, <laughs> Graining rarely actually used that column to write about music. Uh, he would mostly just write about his hobbies or what interested him. He basically used it as like a, a uh, like you know a, a blog kind of. He'd just like write whatever the fuck he wanted. Uh, so he got some criticism like, oh, you don't really talk about music that much. So in response to that, he basically started to just make things up. He would review bands and albums that didn't actually exist, you know, and uh, he. <laughs> Just continue to basically write whatever the fuck he wanted to write, um, but he would he would do like these fake reviews of these fake albums, and then the next week he'd be like, "Yeah, that was all lies, but these albums are real," and he would review some more albums that were, you know, of course, totally made up. Um, just kind of his sense of humor. That's cool. Uh, so uh, his life in hell comic um, started to get uh, some notice. Uh, you know, it started getting published in other papers across america um not a huge amount because it's you know it's not something you're gonna see in like your your local paper um because it's a little bit more uh you know outsider i guess but it started growing some popularity it started to become kind of an underground hit uh and this caught the attention of uh hollywood producer james l brooks who uh contacted graining in 1985 about the prospect of working on an animated project which turned out to be some shorts for the uh, Tracy Ullman show. Now, this this is um, actually where I first became aware of The Simpsons, and I think a lot of people did. I would uh, I would compare it to Beavis and Butthead and how they got their start as a show. They started as these weird little... The Tracy Ullman show was like a sketch comedy show. Yes. Uh, on HBO. And I got my hands on it because I had this aunt. Well, this had the, a black this iteration of the tra- this iteration of the Tracy Ullman show was actually on Fox. But, oh, it was. Uh, she, she did later get an HBO show after okay. after that one didn't work out. But uh, yeah, but this, it, they were they were like weird little shorts. And I guess I misspoke, although I don't really consider these to be Simpsons. But while we were all living together back in the fucking tinderbox, mm-hmm. I think you and I, TJ, sat down at one point and watched a bunch of the old Tracy Ullman skits. Yes, we did. Yep. Um, and they're surprisingly good. Uh, yeah. They, and, uh, the, it's a very different style of humor. I think it's more, uh, directly what Matt Groening would have, it was more his exact sense of humor. Oh um, yeah. But they're, they are really fun and they're, they're kind of like effortlessly philosophical and, uh, charming. Um, they're not like hilariously laugh out loud, funny or anything for the most part, but, They've got like a certain like charm to them and like they see they're like the more you watch them, the more you're like, this is kind of deeper than it initially appears on a surface level. But it's more subdued than the typical Simpsons episode, you know, so I think that's why people, you know, and obviously, too, they weren't working a huge budget. The animation style is, you know, it's what you expect for something that's kind of ramshackle, but it still really works. Um, Well, there's a kind of a reason behind that. Um, uh, Paul, did you want to say anything else about those Simpsons shorts that we watched? I just I I really enjoy um and and I found myself enjoying this in a lot of different things. I really enjoy the economy of them because the Simpsons as it stands now feels over long. And these they didn't have that time. They're like, you know, 2 to 3 minute at the max little sketches. Now they might have had some continuity between them. Like oftentimes in the Tracy Ullman sketches you would see um you know like Bart and Lisa doing a puzzle together or something right and you'd have a minute where they make some little philosophical uh observation about the puzzle and then the next episode might be them sitting there still playing the puzzle and there's another observation right so they there was would, a they would do kind of repeat they would do like kind of uh different takes on the same setup right and it would i really love that i'm i'm a huge fan of trying to wring every little possible amount of humor and insight out of uh, what seems to be kind of a, uh, a like a small observation 
Oh, yeah. I mean, like, that's a big part of my humor. I'm not claiming to be Matt Groening, but, <laughs> um, you know, my humor style is that way. I have a way of, like, taking a joke, making it, and then rethinking it and trying to make it again and again and again and find new angles on it. Well, that was and definitely that- a specialty of those early Simpsons shorts. Absolutely. And uh, those shorts, they basically served as bumpers to lead in and out of commercial breaks for uh, the Tracy Ullman show. Right. Um, so originally... Matt Groening was uh, just going to animate his popular comic, Life in Hell, which you see here. Um, it, it was selling well on you know, underground bookstores and stuff. And, uh, you know, his I think the first volume of uh, and th- uh, the first collection he published of Life in Hell comics sold about 22,000 copies, which is pretty fucking good for an underground comic. Yeah. Um, but uh, he, he, he fucking at this point, you know, he'd been doing this comic for pretty seriously for, you know, uh, five years and, and he'd been doing it overall for like, I don't know, uh, eight or something like that. So at this point, this this guy is like thinking like life and hell is my life's work, you know, and if I fucking give it to Fox, I'm going to lose the rights and I'm going to lose control. So instead while he was waiting in the lobby outside of James L. Brooks's office, he basically, in a panic, like, I can't give away the rights to my fucking golden goose here, he just really quickly sketches out this fucking cartoon family. And just, you know, with and just names them after his own family members. This is Homer. This is fucking Lisa. This is Maggie. This is Marge. You know? Well, I guess right. the paper worked. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, Matt did these really like rough drawings because he assumed that when they actually animated them, they were going to clean up these designs, but they didn't. So like the reason that the, 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 the design of the original Simpsons, it looks kind of like hurried is because it was. Um, so basically this thing that grew into this multi billion dollar empire was literally something that a guy uh, threw together last minute because he got cold feet about giving the rights to his comic life in hell to Fox basically uh, scribbled something down on a cocktail napkin. Yeah. He's like, here, this is my new concept. It's the uh, Simpsons, you know, uh, which is almost like the fact that that's true is almost a Simpsons joke in and of itself. It reminds me of the episode of Homer has to file his taxes. Yeah. And he's just like, <laughs> you know I mean? yeah, he just throw it like, <laughs> If anyone yeah, asked, Maggie's yeah. nine people, you know, it's like, um, so yeah, it's totally thrown. I mean, like the Simpsons were basically, this is not, it was just thrown together haphazardly in a fucking second. Ah, Simpsons. It's a family. Yeah, yeah like waiting for the fucking big meeting going, oh shit, uh, Homer, Marge, Maggie and Lisa, uh, there's a brat, you know, Bart. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, so thus, that's how the Simpsons were, were born. And although the Tracy Ullman show was not a hit, uh, people did like these animated Simpsons shorts. So uh, Fox said, you know, hey, these uh, Simpson shorts seem like there's something kind of going on here. Maybe we can uh, maybe we can try to see this. And of course, that was a really risky thing at the time because there was no there was no prime time animated fucking comedies on the air. Then now it's like pretty fucking standard. You know, there's a ton of them. But, you know, during this time, that wasn't really a thing that hadn't really been a thing since the Flintstones had gone off the air. Like, I don't know how long before. So no one really expected the show to be a big hit. They thought, you know, we're, it was going to be something that they put on like, you know, I don't remember what the original air, the time slot was, but it was like, you know, put on like Tuesday or some well, bullshit, you know, well, kind of the Tracy Ullman show was like, it's a bumper. It's like, this is kind of like, oh, it's a nice little thing. We can add this to the lineup. Maybe we'll get some kids to watch it or something like there's not really uh, this huge you know, push for the show. It's just like something like, hey, people enjoy this. Maybe we can make this something right. Uh, but there was no expectation of like, this is going to be our big hit, but it was popular literally right out the gate. Like uh, just instantly it came out and it was just people are like, I love, I love this. Um, so basically uh, this obscure underground cartoonist who basically had shit out this low effort idea <laughs> in the lobby to protect the rights to his comic strip uh, somehow inadvertently created what has been labeled the most valuable TV franchise of all time. I mean, it, it has to be uh, like no controversy. Yeah. I mean, there's, the mo- it, it, there's, there's, I can't, I can't think of another property that would even come close. There's some yeah. argument, but not much. It's, it's lit. I mean, like no one has access to all the internal numbers, 
But from the outside looking in, the experts who crunch these kind of numbers have said The Simpsons is the most valuable television property of I mean, all time. It and it's an not American really very controversial movie. to say it. Yeah. It, 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 I, don't, I don't see how it could even be controversial. I mean, they have a fucking goddamn theme park. They have fucking crazy sales. They're fucking, they put out a movie. And this isn't when the show was in its heyday. We're talking 20 years into the show being a thing. And it made fucking half a billion dollars just off box office. Like, I, I mean, like I, the, to, to me, when you talk about the entertainment industry, like there's so few things that don't just immediately experience the law of diminishing returns. And yeah. the Simpsons, is one of those rare things that really, truly hasn't, um, at least not monetarily. Uh, so let's get that a little bigger. <laughs> Uh, the first 10 seasons of The Simpsons are generally regarded as the golden age of The Simpsons. Now, some people exclude the first two seasons from the golden age because they're a bit more on the awkward side. You know, the show hadn't really fully found its footing yet. Some people say the golden age begins at season three. It's some, odd to go back and watch season one Simpsons. It really is. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's beyond, I mean, there's no denial that those early seasons did, you know, they were a little bit awkward compared to what came after. So yeah, but the, the spark was there, like the Homer's voice was done differently in yes. season one. The animation style is a little bit different. The character design. So there's this little there's little things. But, you know, another uh, famous series, TNG, same thing. You know, so I mean, a lot of these television shows, the first season is usually different game it's, of thrones yeah, i can think of a number of shows where the first season was a lot different than the seasons that preceded it game of thrones season one is probably my favorite by the way um many uh say the decline happens in like seasons nine and ten that's when it starts to go downhill um, i've heard people say as early as season seven i would say personally yeah i mean some people say season seven so like you could think the golden age is as small as from season three to season seven uh a lot of people in the fan community say it's from season one to season ten uh, with you know nine and ten marking somewhat of a decline, but not really. It's not bad yet. I would personally say that um, I actually kind of like the um, uh, up to like season like twelve, thirteen myself. Um, there was a different showrunner at that time, uh, but around I think it was season thirteen that uh, this guy Al Jean took over, and I, I I think really his tenure is when I think it just totally goes to shit. Uh, but we'll talk about him a little bit uh, later. But, uh, you know, so you can think you, there's different ideas about when exactly this golden age happened. Um, I would say from like I would say it was for me like seasons like three through 12, maybe uh, some, a lot of people say one through 10. Some people say three through 10. Some people say three through seven. Some people say one through seven, you know, but there's not really any disagreement that there was a golden age of the Simpsons. And, you know, generally, uh, you know, the seasons three through seven seem to be the ones that everybody can agree. This is definitely the golden age. There's some other argue, there's some argument about maybe it began a little earlier, maybe it ended a little later. But if you hear people quoting The Simpsons are talking about it, uh, chances are they're talking about an episode from one of those seasons. Oh, absolutely. Whether you realize it or not, because a lot of times like, oh, no, because it's been on so long. Like, no, it was season 12 or something, I think. And it's like, nope, it was season seven or season six or season four. There was a uh, watch mojo um, about the top 10 Simpsons episodes. And they're like, you know, um, you might notice. And they, they even put an issue thing at the beginning. Like, you might notice that all the episodes we put are from uh, the first 10 seasons. That's not because we didn't consider the other seasons. This is just how it shook out. And, you know, it's just that's just the reality. I mean, like the show just wasn't as good beyond a certain point. Um, so to figure out why I, I, I was, I got really curious about like, why was the golden age so good and what, what went wrong? Like, was it just an inevitability of time or were there like mistakes made that led to a marked decline in this show? You know? Um, and I figured, I figured the best way to figure it out was to look at the worst the Simpsons has to offer. Uh, so I found out that the worst rated episode of the Simpsons on IMDb is called Lisa goes Gaga, which has an IMDb score of about 3.9. Um, oh, oh, uh, oh yeah. Just think about this episode. Sorry about that. man. So I decided to watch this episode cause I wanted to see how low this once great series could go. All three of us. Have yeah. Watched. And, uh, me and, Paul and I asked with you. Yeah. I also asked you and Paul to watch it so that you would have an idea as well uh, by the way, you're a fucking monster dude you're uh, a fucking like dude I, I i've read about 
unethical human experimentation, TJ. And I think <laughs> if, if we're at an addendum of that episode, it'd be making me and Paul watch this fucking episode. TJ's a little monster. Oh, yeah. Oh, he is, isn't he? <laughs> so, um, I, I wrote, I got some, uh, here, here's the, th- I tried to basically look at this episode and ask myself, like, what is the difference between this episode and the golden age of the Simpsons? Like, what makes this so much fucking worse? Did you compare it to, let's say, the, the highest rated episode? Uh, no, I didn't do that, but I just, I, I've been, wa- I mean, I've been watching those early seasons of the Simpsons on Why Disney Plus. I mean, dude, even before you did this episode, I, you would go back and watch the Simpsons probably. Right. Least- so I have a pretty good idea of what, but like I always, I I will revisit those first 10 or 12 seasons pretty frequently, but I will not go beyond that because every time I've even stuck a toe in that territory, I've been like, Oh my God. I had a thing for a few years where I was like, you know what? I don't want to watch the regular Simpsons, but I really love Treehouse of horrors. And I tried to watch one maybe two or three years ago. And I was like, Nope, I'm done. I don't watch fucking Simpsons again. Get that shit away from me. This is fucking, I don't know what this is. But this needs to stay the fuck away from me. So uh, maybe you guys would like to offer up some of your impressions of this episode before we kind of get into comparing and contrasting. Um, I found watching it to be way more interesting than I thought it would be. Not necessarily because it was good, but because it, I felt a lot of different ways about it in, in watching it. You had warned me that it was going to feel like two hours. And on one hand, it kind of did. On another hand, it was over before it started for me. Like yeah. it, it was like, oh, okay, that's that's the episode because I remember, you know, trying to look back on when I watched The Simpsons. It was kind of expert at creating these simple little setups that felt like a full cohesive story arc happened. You yes. know, so it might be something as simple as Bart cheating on a test or Lisa subverting her very rigid moral code and then learning why she shouldn't do that. But it felt like there was a, a very distinct beginning, middle, end. Yes. This episode never establishes either a beginning or an end. It just exists. It's it's really hard to explain. It's just there. It's very abrupt in its, in its uh, execution. I mean, and one of the signs of the decline of The Simpsons to me was the fact of these guest spots. And this thing with Lady Gaga, it's like, yeah, there's some like very mild, like, oh, here's a little jab at her, but... It's like her character is just boring for the show. It doesn't add anything. It's just over the top. It's more just like the it's more like the visual style. It's like it's like the show kind of forgot that the writing is so essential to it. And it's just this big visual spectacle. It doesn't really feel like and I mean, that's cool. I cracked a smile like, oh, OK, you know, Homer's a bad parent during the episode with Lisa. He's inept. You know, everyone's trying to help Lisa, but she has to kind of realize she has to help herself, you know, but it's just it just feels like a ham fisted thing. To promote Lady Gaga. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a giant Lady Gaga advertisement. Yes, for sure. it, it was. Uh, you know, look, so celebrity guests, uh, long st- standing sort of tradition on The Simpsons. Sure. But I feel like in the classic golden era of The Simpsons, there was like if you came on The Simpsons, you were coming to get not like annihilatedly roasted, but you were there to be roasted a little bit. To make know? fun of yourself. Right. And you never really get the sense in this episode that they have any sort they're, they're like they definitely pull their if they have any punches against Lady Gaga, they, they pull them like shit. There's like basically no criticism of her. She's almost she's basically portrayed as like a saint okay. yeah. in the episode. I mean, there's there's basically no fucking criticism. Um, yeah, the jabs are like, oh, she's wearing a meat suit. That's uh, uh, that's funny. She changes outfits a lot. Oh, you got her. You skewered her, Simpsons. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. all right. So here's what I have for the differences between the classic Golden Age Simpsons approach in this. So the first thing I I wrote down was the show no longer respects its characters. Um, I think that uh, the narrative has lost its grounding. And that's kind of what Paul, I think, was touching on a minute ago. Just, you know, there's not a beginning, middle and end sort of structure here. And we don't have any real sense of uh, there being a a drive. Like there's not really there's not really a narrative at all. It's just here's some stuff. 
the pacing is totally fucked and it's fucked because like it, it's like the simpsons has tried to become mad magazine or something where it's like you know uh, it's not like the 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 fucking jokes don't come out of the situation it's like the jokes come first you know it's like we got to just cram as many fucking jokes in here as we can even if they have nothing to do with the plot, like we'll just have a total aside that just just to make this fucking joke. And most of them are not even good jokes. Well, ins- instead of creating something new, like, kind of like having this synthesis of like, okay, yeah, we have these, well, this guest spot, but we're gonna have, still have our own story. It's it's becoming uh, like more like a collab. It's like, hey, we want to shoehorn Lady Gaga into an episode of The Simpsons, and how do we do it? So that, that's that's kind of like the, the the first premise. So instead of like getting things. Or being the popular thing that's the, that's the lightning rod drawing people, it's let's bring popular things into the show so people will be interested because hey, there's this popular person or whatever. I feel like there's no humanity left in in these characters on this show. Like I feel like they basically exist as half remembered stereotypes of the characters that were established earlier on in the series and. Like, there's no real exploration of who they are at this point. It's just, this is Lisa Simpson. You all know who that is. Now she's going to fucking meet Lady Gaga. There you go. Yep. I mean, but isn't it also the fact that you've been doing something for so long? It's like the characters, maybe they're just not. I mean, you're keeping them in almost a static environment. There's only so many times that Lisa can have a moral quandary. Right. There's only so many times that Bart can be like, I'm not listening to my parents. I'm defying authority. But, oh, look, at I, I have to have my just rewards now. I have to then I have to face the consequences of my actions. Yeah, and there's only so many times that Homer can neglect his family and then remember why he loves them so much. <laughs> right. You know what I mean, there's um, only so many times that Marge can be put in a position of of having an existential crisis about being a housewife. Right. It's, uh, eventually, the storyline just feels tired, and it's just like, it's a bad television trope at a certain point. I feel like the main thing that's missing now is uh, storytelling, though. I feel I like ab- above all else, it's the storytelling that's lacking. Uh, and I think Paul identified that pretty well when he just said, "Now there's a, you know, Matt Stone and Trey Parker of uh, South Park fame. They have a certain technique they apply to their their writing." Um, when they're outlining a story, they have something called the but and therefore rule. And it's a really simple rule. Um, when you are lining outlining a story and you're talking and you're fucking basically draw, like writing out all the story beats, you know, if you put if the, the thing that comes in between the beats of the story is and then basically you're fucked because that's boring. If you can put the words but or therefore in between, then you have a story in which events taking place are reacting to one another. And the story and plot builds momentum and tension based on everything else that has happened previously, not because of the arbitrary whims of the writer. Right. So it's a it's a very different thing between this happens and then this happens versus yeah. this happens. Therefore, this happens. This happens. But this other thing happens that's in conflict with that. Right. Well, and the we'll Simpsons is Lady Gaga episode. We, we, it's like, oh, how does Lady Gaga find Lisa? Oh, I have a connection with she Lisa. She has so magical just, psychic powers and she just knows Lisa's sad. And then Lisa's sad. And then Lisa needs to get better. And then they, ha- they hang out. And then this happens. Yeah. I mean, you can totally see that play out. There's not a lot of but, therefore. And, you know, I have my own criticisms of South Park. We could get into some other time. Maybe we'll do a f- fucking rise and fall of South Park. But in terms of this... They fucking they they understand story structure in a way that the Simpsons definitely has just completely forgotten about. Um, And I think we see it pretty clearly in that fucking Lady Gaga episode. Um, So there's an episode of season nine of the Simpsons that a lot of people identify as the the jumping the shark moment. Uh, This is uh, the principal and the pauper. I think it's the second episode of season nine. Uh, a lot of fans despise this episode. A lot of fans say that this episode represents the official end of the golden age. I'm not with them on that, but this is a, I don't know. I, I don't really know. I don't know exactly what my feelings are on this episode. I'll be honest with you. But um, basically the premise is that um, principal Skinner 
is uh, he he's revealed as uh, a fraud. He's not actually Seymour Skinner. He's uh, Armin Tamzarian. Who, uh, you know, he, he replaced the uh, like the real Seymour Skinner died in the war, or at least we, the, the, you know, it was thought that he died in the war. And so Armin Tamzarian uh, steals his life. And comes back and, you know, declares, I'm Seymour Skinner. And he basically pursues, you know, Seymour Skinner's dream of becoming a high school, of a, a, a middle school principal or whatever, or elementary school principal. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, then the real Seymour Skinner shows up. Uh, Armin, conv- uh, you know, confesses that he's a fraud, that he's not the real Skinner. And, uh, you know, the town fucking runs him off. And uh, then it turns out that they realize they like the old Skinner better than the new Skinner. So they basically uh, go and get uh, Armin Tamzarian back and say, we want you to be Skinner again. And they literally run the real Seymour Skinner out on the rails. They tie, they literally tie him to a fucking railway car and, and uh, send him to the next town or whatever. Um, Tell me. Yeah, and then they basically say like you know anyone who no you know anyone who fucking mentions Armin Tamzarian or refers to him as anyone other than Seymour Skinner will be you know tortured. So this is the end of this matter. This is Seymour Skinner, fucking whatever. So um, a lot of fans they didn't really like this. They were you know they were like um, you know we've kind of uh, invested in this character over time, and we don't like that you you did this with the character. And uh, Harry Shearer, the voice of Principal Skinner, um, was among the uh, the dissent. I mean, he still obviously did the voice for it, but he did say to the writers, basically, uh, this is wrong. You're taking someone the audience has built eight, year, eight or nine years of investment in and just tossing it in the trash can for no good reason. Uh, for a story we've done before with other characters, it's so arbitrary and gratuitous and it's disrespectful to the audience. And a lot of the audience seems to agree that it was disrespectful. Uh, Matt Groening himself has described the episode as a mistake and one of his least favorite episodes. Um, but uh, Ken Keeler, the um, that's not Ken Keeler, that's Harry Shearer. Ken Keeler, the uh, writer of the episode, has uh, stated that uh, he basically this is his counterpoint to the, these uh, claims. Uh, this episode is about a community of people who like things just the way they are. Skinner's not really close to these people. You know, he's a minor character, but they get upset when someone comes in and says, uh, this is not really the way things are, and they run the messenger out of town on a rail. Uh, When the episode aired, lo and behold, a community of people who like things just the way they are got mad. It never seemed to occur to anyone that this episode is about the people who hate it. Right. It seems like a a really, like, lazy way to do things. Like, t- like, just put it, put it, put the shoe on any other foot in the series. Like Homer is not really Homer, you know. He's he's Wilford Nudson, <laughs> who met the real Homer Simpson back when they were kids and decided to, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's it's like you're trying to piss people off with it, and it and it also it smacks of laziness. It's like okay, well, we've explored everything that we can do with this character, so let's just. Let's just make him somebody else. You know what I mean? He was never this character. He was always this guy. Yeah. And um, you know, I can't I can't think of something that's more antithetical to the original premise of those Tracy Ullman sketches than that. You know what I mean? Right. Like even it's before like, these characters were established. You go from like something that was very simple to something that's like very convoluted and kind of like, eh, fuck you. I'm changing Unnec- shit up. Unnecessary. I mean, right. despite their despite the simplicity, it seems like especially in those early sketches and in the early seasons, they were committed to not giving up on the premise of these characters and to finding all the weird little pockets of exploration that they could do within these character archetypes and come up with actual believable changes in personality for these characters as time went on. Right. That were, that were true to the original premise of the character. Yeah. And And that just seems like the engine that the early Simpsons ran on. Yeah. And this is, this is the opposite of that. Right. And, you know, one of the things that one of the things I said when we were talking about the Lisa goes Gaga episode was I feel like the show doesn't really respect its characters anymore. So, I mean, like you could almost look at this as maybe the beginning of like, eh, 
they're just whatever we need them to be for the plot. Right. Yeah. You know? and, I, and I don't like that. I mean, like, look, consistency builds a lot of things, you know, like you need that. You need this foundational support to make all of this stuff work. And if you take out that, that those support pillars, ultimately left with is what, you know, the so-called, you know, the zombie symptoms, which I'm sure we're about to get into. And you can really start seeing the, this is where you see the cracks. Because I don't think this episode sinks season nine. I don't think it's oh, it's it's horrible, but it's it's already showing the ability and the writers saying oh, we're just we're just trying to piss people off and we're trying to, it's like yeah, I understand that, but there's so many other story arcs. You could have had a more edgy story arc. You could have had a more subversive story arc that still stayed true to these characters. But you know when you discard nine seasons of building someone up, it's it's not going to fucking work. And you're not going to please the fans. And I mean like like look, it's like you know. It's like, oh, so we're watching Rick and Morty, and Rick's like, you know, I'm going to AA now. It's like, come on. This is fucking stupid. This is not like, yeah, you can stir the pot with these characters, but if you do it in such a way it's inauthentic, people are just going to obviously reject that. So uh, the Simpsons movie, I think it was actually pretty good, even though it comes uh, well after the Golden Age. And uh, well, they spent a lot of time working on this movie as well. Well, you know, another thing is they actually brought back a lot of the uh, Golden Age writers who hadn't worked on the show for quite some time. Um, so this is a guy that I think you guys might both find kind of interesting. Um, not much is not a whole lot's known about this guy. This is a uh, John Schwartzwelder who wrote no less than 59 episodes of the Simpsons, uh, mostly in the golden age. Um, and he also worked. I mean, he, these, those are the episodes he wrote outright. He also worked on a bunch of other episodes just as like pun- doing punch up and stuff like that. Uh, this guy, um, this is basically like the only picture that exists of him. As far as I can tell, wow, um, he's a super reclusive guy. Uh, after like season three or four, they they started letting him work from home because he didn't want to be around the other writers. Shit, um, he is a hardcore right wing libertarian who avoids any press. He is uh, anti environmentalist, even though he's written several pro environmentalist episodes. He is uh, super pro gun. Uh, so not really the pedigree you'd expect from, uh, you know, someone who was a writer for The Simpsons, who's, which has never really seemed like much of a, a right leaning kind of TV show. Um, um, but, you know, this guy's this guy. It, 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 he's so um, he's so strange that uh, people, I guess there's even been like speculation that maybe he's not real. Like maybe this is like like, like a, a pseudonym for somebody else. Yeah, or like just like a fictitious person that the writing staff of The Simpsons, you know, came up with to kind of trick people. Um, he's never participated in any sort of uh, uh, like DVD commentaries or anything like that. He doesn't doesn't do, go to the fan gatherings. No, he doesn't Q&As. do A's. Doesn't do that kind of stuff. Doesn't do press interviews. Well, I know um, Matt. Graining does a lot of these like like he tours. I mean, someone just put the question to him. I'm sure it's been brought to him. Um, but uh, you know, this guy, uh, the one, of the, he, this is one of the dudes who he stopped work. He stopped writing for The Simpsons in like 2003, uh, and even then, he that was after years of slowing down. Like, but during like the golden age, he was like cranking out scripts, like 59 episodes. That's basically three seasons worth of fucking episodes, uh, just written by this guy alone, and. Um, uh, you know, he they, he was one of the dudes that was brought back for the movie that hadn't worked on the show in years. Um, and, you know, he hasn't worked on the show since. Um, and a lot of, the, you know, a ton of the people who worked on the movie were people who uh, hadn't uh, worked on the show in years. In fact, uh, let's talk about um, this guy here. This is the guy who has been in charge of The Simpsons since season 13, which uh, coincidentally is right around the time I stopped caring for the show. Now, for this reason, maybe erroneously, I blame this guy for the show's decline more than anyone else because he's been the showrunner since then. And, uh, you know, pri- I think we all know why, dude. It's to feed the neck, fat dude. Yeah, he's got to feed the neck. Yeah, he's I'm definitely Lucas. got a uh, Lucas. He, uh, neck. He's got a George Lucas neck. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't really care too much for uh, the creative decisions that have been made under uh, this guy's leadership. Um you know, I mean, we've already gotten into the reasons why um, I don't think he's maintained good standards on the show. I don't think he's sought out good t- uh, talents to work on the show. And uh, I think because that uh, I think, the, uh, you know, like, let's think about this for a second. This show, despite 
most people kind of agreeing it has not been good in 20 fucking years has been on the air for 31 fucking years. So I mean, like, do that? it has yeah. obvious staying power. And like, it's pretty crazy for a show to survive um, 20 years of fucking being terrible. Dude, a lot of shows, if you're not fucking at your peak, like where you were, I mean, like, look at fucking Game of Thrones. It was the biggest show on television. It's like, oh, these guys have an offer to do some Star Wars shit or something. Oh, let's wrap this show up. Like, or let's say you have a bad season. Oh, season four wasn't that great or whatever. I mean, those shows are like, there's a discussion like, is that show getting axed? I mean, to go 20, to go longer than, I mean, the majority of the time uh, under the auspices of like, this is not a good show to last that long is unheard of. And I think it's just based on the insane strength of those early seasons and the tremendous influence. And it really kind of has brought this show to the point of, of being a cultural institution. And it's just it's crazy to think that there might be an alternate reality where someone who understood what made that show great had been put in charge of the show. And maybe it wouldn't. I mean, like, you know, obviously time is going to to you know to, it's going to have its toll but i don't think the show needs to be as bad today as it is um it lasted 31 seasons and counting even with more than half of the seasons being lousy like a full two-thirds of the seasons being pretty much lousy and unwatchable um, i think it survives purely on the strength of that golden age but the more i contemplate it the more i kind of like looked into stuff for this episode I started to think, you know, there's really no reason this, sh- this show couldn't be good. The fact that people are still looking to this show and still talking about this show and it's still been on the air and it's still generating money, like that shows me that there's like a genuine hunger out there for the fucking Simpsons. Yeah, you know what, TJ? That's there's not being no delivered on. The Browns should have won the Super Bowl by now, but. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I, I mean, mean I-, I don't know. Like for me. I look at this as a creative collaboration that's ongoing. Right. And, and some of the principal players have changed. But being a dude that at least the five, the last five or so years of my life has worked creatively. Yeah. I One of the things that you got to realize is something like this is only strong as long as the people that are doing it still believe in it. And maybe that's what's happened. You know, um, it's it's you can get tired of doing something. Right. And keeping keeping a creative collaboration or a creative enterprise fresh is probably the most fucking important thing to its longevity because people can still be hungry for shit. Yeah. I mean, we constantly get, you know, in our fan communities and shit. Oh, man, I missed old DP, man. And <laughs> yeah. it's just like that was a that was a, a for a lot of us, I think, an idea that ran its course for us personally. Yeah. Yeah. We were just kind of done with it. And there are still people, and there probably always will be people that watched that original thing, just like with the Simpsons here. Yeah, that are like, man, it could, it could be, it could be. Well, maybe it couldn't be if the people that are making it no longer believe in what it is, and they're just cashing checks on it. There's really no room for it to be that anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I feel like maybe if you got the right people in there who actually understood, I mean, maybe it, it might be too late now. But I, I'm more thinking about. I, I guess it's, I, I guess I don't think it's too late now. But uh, you know, it, it probably would have been better if uh, you know someone had taken stock of what's going on. Uh, you know, after a few years of Al Jean's leadership oh, and said this ain't working. But uh, he's he's kept a what, fucking. What, are, what is Fox? What was Fox and now Disney looking at? They're looking at how much money is it making. They're right. not looking at oh, do people still have the same warm and fuzzy feeling inside like but they don't realize they, these shows they don't realize that that warm and fuzzy feeling is what translated to money in the first place yeah but we're talking about bean counters we're talking about fucking television executives right who don't get that at all are like i don't give a fuck you know the episode needs to cost this amount of uh, it needs to be produced you know it's like it's how much this episode cost to produce how many viewers did it have? How much is the merchandise making? It's, dollar, it's, it's fucking dollars and cents. And, you know, you're right. If you made a better product, would people more people like it? Sure. But if you can make an inferior product and almost get the same number of people, who gives a fuck is the mentality. And, like, I think, like, us looking at it and like, as, like, people who loved this show when we were growing up, it, 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 it it's painful. But at the same time, when you see the economic success, you under like, I think pragmatically you have to understand, like, yeah, it could be good, but 
it doesn't have to be. And if something doesn't, and, and, and the last two, 20 seasons prove that it doesn't have to be good. Yeah. And if it doesn't have to be, then they're not going to put that effort in. Uh, there's another angle on this too, that I think bears exploring. a little Sure. Bit. Go ahead, Paul. What about the fans being responsible for the decline of this show? Because they're unwilling to accept new angles. Yeah. They're so married to the idea of these characters living in the space that they've come to recognize them in Mm -hmm. that they're unwilling to allow the people that make the show to uh, come up with fundamental ways of changing the narrative. So like, for example, okay, uh, uh, well, let me, let me just, uh, can I just like rephrase what you said to make sure sure that I'm on the same page? Are you, are you basically saying that, uh, the reason the show sucks so bad now is because, uh, the fans will not allow the sort of changes that need to happen to uh, have it escape this tired fucking format and formula in the box that it's basically stuck in. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm not saying that that is definitively the answer. I'm just exploring it as a possibility. Right. And this comes, you know, a, a lot of it from my own experience where you have something that really resonates with, with people and you as a creator kind of feel like man i want to fundamentally change this like i don't want to i don't want to decimate it i don't want to make it something that's completely unrecognizable but i want to fundamentally change the way that this goes and the fan base is just not willing to allow you to do that like like think think about uh i I don't know i'm just off the top of my head here marge and simps uh, marge and homer uh, get a divorce Right now, I know that they've played with that idea. There have been multiple episodes that were centered around straining the relationship between Marge and Homer. Sure. But what about if that comes to its logical conclusion and they actually break up and you go forward season after season with the kids spending half time with each of them? Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't think that the fan base would accept that. But maybe that would allow the people that are creating this show, not just the performers, but the writers and the showrunner and everything, an additional pocket of American life to explore. Right. And they, it's like, hey, maybe. So basically you're saying that I, I think like the show is so stale that it needs a shakeup, but the fans are so resistant to a shakeup that. Oh, my Marsh can't get divorced. No. Oh, no, no, no. Or maybe a pre- uh, like a main character just croaking. You know what I mean? Like maybe Homer has a heart attack and he actually dies. You know what I mean? And he's gone and he only comes back in flashbacks here and there, but the world moves forward without Homer in it. Now I'm not saying I like that idea because I'm, I'm kind of locked into that same mentality, but I imagining a world in which the Simpsons exists and something as, as world changing as that happens, maybe it would freshen up the the passion of the people that are writing and performing the show you know what i mean it's risky and and that's the thing that look these studios don't want that risk because like you said i agree with you like look and and, and others have proven it rick and morty they've done they've done storylines like that that fundamentally change what happens with the characters and, and and that and then stay true to that the simpsons very easily and i think you actually had a, your first thing was actually a great idea homer and marge get divorced that's something that happens all the time in this country. So many people can relate. It's not an unrelatable event where it's like that. So it's like Patty and Selma, you know, they get to be like, ah, oh, we told you, Marge. You know, you, you have uh, you have the family angle. You have Homer desperately trying to woo Marge back, you know. Well, you know, and the thing about it is, too, if it doesn't work, then in like a couple seasons, you could just go back to their together again. You know, it's not it's not that hard to undo. Like they, or you can or you can have an ongoing on again, off again, because that's that, you know, a lot of people exist in that space. Yeah. The, the the one of the reasons I think that the the Simpsons fundamentally resonated with people at the time that it became popular was because it was like this great big avatar of family life at that time, the strong central family union, the bro, the brother and the sisters, and the dad, the beer drinking dad, and the homemaker mom. All of that, it, it was like inviting people of all ages and all classes to find a character in this show, whether it was one of the principal characters or a side character. That there was, they were like, "Hey, this is kind of like me. I'm kind of this guy. I'm the weird Christian guy that lives down the street. You know, I'm the, I'm the fucking ruthless boss. I'm the lackey of the ruthless boss. I'm the <laughs> old grandpa. I'm the kid." One of the things about the Simpsons that we haven't really touched on yet is it was pretty rare for a sitcom to appeal so broadly to every age demographic. When I was fucking six, seven, eight years old, I was just as into this as my parents were. 
It, right. it, it managed to be a show that kids could watch and have fun with. And parents could watch and have fun with and well, identify with one at the same time. In, in the next episode that we're going to do for our uh, patrons, we're going to talk all about the characters of The Simpsons because I think one of the, str- the big strengths of this show is that you know you can pretty much there there is a Simpsons character that pretty much is you, like right. or at least like or has multiples. A, you yeah. might see aspects of yourself oh, in wow. multiples of these characters. Like, yeah, like for me, just looking at the screen now. Yeah, I identify with Homer. Being a I mean, fat everybody, I think every man identifies in some respect with fucking Homer Simpson. I mean, I identify with Krusty. I do, too. I'm 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 more and more as time goes on identifying with Abraham. There's still a part of me that identifies with Bart. You know what I mean? Like there are uh, any number of characters in this that have a little slice of me in them. And it being so rigidly married to this idea of the nuclear family unit i think has it, times have changed yeah and i mean it's know, been let me nine uh, on 40 fucking years that this show has been on right you know what i mean let me build on that a little bit because one of the interesting things i came across in my research is nothing i didn't put in my document but um you know because of the ageless nature of the simpsons uh as you know times have changed they've had to kind of adjust the backstories of these characters and at this point, the the official narrative is you know that that Marge and Homer you know grew up in the uh, the nineties you know or the two thousands at this point, um, you know because um, Homer is like thirty five years old I think, Marge is probably around the same age, uh, you know so they they're but like, does Homer Simpson really doesn't seem like a product of the fucking nineties at all you know he seem he really seems like a product he, he seems like more like a dude who grew up in the fucking seventies and eighties you know which is what you know his original backstory fucking was he, he comes across now to people was more like a like a fucking boomer like, or something or maybe Gen X I mean, but I mean, that, like that's think, being generous think about it officially right now Homer Simpson is a millennial I mean right. that doesn't make sense you know it what I mean no fucking sense Another major change that I think the show could explore that might freshen it up is breaking the ageless nature. Like what, what if they decided like starting with this season, these kids are going to grow up and we're going to start following their lives. We're going to, you know, Marge and Homer are going to become grandparents and Bart is going to become the family man and how we see how he approaches that reflected in how he was raised by his father. That would be an interesting thing as this audience ages that might bring people back. You know what I mean? And so, but, but it would also mean a fundamental change to one of the principal things about this show. Right. Which is that it's timeless and it's ageless and no one Bart, changes. Bart is, uh, you know, he's always in fifth grade. Well, Lisa's well, always in fourth grade. Well, not true to reality. The world is filled with constant change. And yeah, you can update and say, Homer's a millennial now, but, Homer hasn't changed fundamentally. None of these characters have had a you know fundamental transformation that justifies that of saying. It. So it's you can say that, but it's not true because we know reality around us changes constantly. And obviously, the nature of television shows some things had to be you remain static, you know, for character design. But I think the reason why is because it's cheaper to draw Bart the same way. It's cheaper to draw Homer the same way. It's just that the risk there. I think is that there's so many unknown things, and you can make those gambles. But I think the Simpsons has been conservative and has played it safe. And that's probably part of the reason it has had its staying power. Because when you don't take those chances, you're less likely to have failure. But, you know, what you end up with, instead of having some sort of cataclysmic, like, all right, well, you know, the show made a bad choice and now it's lost the audience. Like, what's happened instead is the show's oh, become so fucking stagnant that no one really watches it anymore. And really, it exists because it sells a lot of merch and it fucking, you know... It's it's pop. I mean, like it's a the it's Simpsons. Is, the Simpsons well, is, branding is, is everything. A, branding is right. everything. If you put the Simpsons on something, everyone goes the Simpsons. Even if you don't like the Simpsons, have never watched an episode of the Simpsons, you know what the fuck the Simpsons are. It's it, it's obvious. That's I mean, like so. Then that's the biggest thing. Like a lot of people like you ask like you know why is a car company these or Coca Cola have advertisements? Like everyone knows what a fucking Coke tastes like or what it is. It's just that it puts it in your mind. By the way, the um, has been thirty years of that. Matt Groening for years has tried to get them to do something new with this concept, uh, mostly in the form of like spinoff shows. Like he wanted to do a crusty, he wanted to do another show that was built all around crusty, the clown or anybody like, but these, the, the people at Fox, the people who control this property do not want to change anything. They're terrified of change. 
Uh, and I guess I could see why they're making fucking hundreds of millions of dollars every year merchandising this stuff. So I mean, I can sympathize with that. Any threat I mean, to I'm the, not, any threat to I, their I status would welcome qu- yeah. fundamental change in the narrative structure, but there is a chance that it just goes bad. It doesn't resonate. It doesn't. You know, people don't want it, and they're not selling as much merch. Right. And I think we have to remember the time when this was made. The only way to get a shot like this out there was you had to go to a network. And it's fundamentally the power dynamic has shifted a lot in these entertainment spaces where it's like Matt Groening to get this show made pretty much had to, you know, hey, sell your soul to Fox. You know, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that because, you know, a lot of shows now, the showrunners can literally be the people that created the show. Right. You don't have, you know, but at the time, there's no way they're going to do that. They're not going to spend millions upon millions of dollars and have Matt Groening say, you know what, Fox isn't even treating me right. I'm going over to ABC or whatever. They're not going to fucking take right. That so the power dynamics have definitely changed a lot since then because, like you know, when you look at like a show like Rick and Morty, I mean, Justin Roiland, its creator, has enormous fucking control over what happens on that show. Yeah, the season doesn't happen if unless he says yep, unless he gives a thumbs up. If he if it was 20 years ago, Rick and Morty came out. If he says nope, they go who gives a show what you have to say, Justin Roiland? The show's coming out. You didn't write the script, so fucking what? The show's coming out. Uh, that's what that, you know, that's a studio approach. Uh, does anyone else have anything else to say, or you think we're, we've pretty much uh, explored this one? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it it's weird that it went there, but I really would. I I think I would try and come back and watch this show. Not necessarily if they had to fundamentally change everything about it, but if they took a risk. Yeah, because w- watching that that um, Lady Gaga episode really underlined for me in a very stark way how stuck in time the show is it really has run its course in terms of being able to keep these characters exactly the same as they've always been it's like the 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 fundamental uh uh, conundrum that lisa faces i've seen it a million times it's like lisa is the character in the show that uh maybe more than any character has this very very strong moral compass Right. She's a, she's really the moral vo- voice of the show. Absolutely. Yeah. And oopsie daisy, something happens and she subverts that moral compass. She she acts more like Bart would act or she does something that's not ethical. And they're really just writing that same storyline over and over again with no update to the characters, no update to the world that they live in. And um I really would I I would at least try to watch this show if they made some kind of fundamental change, at least to the lives of these characters. They could keep these characters the same. How interesting would it be to see a divorced Homer yeah, or a grandpa Homer, you know, that, that is slowly but surely becoming Abraham or a Waylon Smithers who in the wake of uh, the death of Mr. Burns tries to bring his more optimistic approach to being a boss. He steps into the role, but finds himself more and more becoming this ruthless, you know what I mean? Yeah. There, there could be these really interesting fundamental changes in these characters that would update it, that would make it feel more like real life. Uh, it would yeah. make it feel more like a contemporary show. It, and that's really, that would bring me back. It needs a shakeup. It needs a shakeup. I think that, I don't know if it's guaranteed to bring people back, but I think people would tune in at least for a little while to see, like, does will this actually work? You know, what, How does this what play out? Saying, as a fundamental thing that you need to get ahead in life, you know, and it's take a fucking chance. You know, the Simpsons, yeah, they have it has success. But you know what's more important than success at this point? It's having the love of a fucking people or an audience or a group and just saying, you know what? When I'm fucking down and out and I want something to fucking escape reality, especially in times like this, I can turn to this. This is something that gives me this comfort and joy. I identify with these characters. I have a connection with this. And that's really what entertainment, I think, at its core is really about. It's about getting some sort of reaction from people. And like now when you watch The Simpsons, there's just a, tal- a, a kind of a callous disregard. Like me and Paul and you watched the episode, but there was not, I never, I never felt connected to the characters. I never felt connected to the episode. I never felt like, oh, Lady Gaga, oh, yeah, they're taking some shots or, you know, release. It's like, it's like it's, I was bored. So this and is, I, and I barely watched the episode. This is a uh, different chart than the one we looked at earlier. This is about the decline of um, ratings. So this just shows you kind of uh, what's what's happened with The Simpsons over time. Um, and you see it's a pretty steady downward trajectory. Like, you know, eventually this is going to fucking hit to the point where it's not profitable to produce this show anymore. It reminds me it reminds me of a Simpsons joke. One of my favorites that that Enron roller coaster. Oh, 
<laughs> oh my god, we're all gonna die. Oh, we broke even. Ah, you know. <laughs> and you Can see you just... all that maybe. So you see, I... there's uh, this spike. You see this uh, upward spike here. That was actually when the movie came out. Uh, that kind of breathed a little more life into it for a little while. Um, you know, this initial decline, like it came out, it was huge. You know, and there was there was some decline here uh, throughout these these uh, these years. Even like this is. The most precipitous pro- decline probably is during like what's considered the golden age because it but, but it you, started you off know, so high, you know. And uh, the time too, that you're thinking about this too, like when the, the novelty wears off. I mean, sure. even if it's really good, people are going to go, "Oh, I've seen that." Then there's always the next big thing that comes out. Oh, everyone's watching this now. I mean, it, it, a series like this is bound to plateau. I think it could have uh, potentially plateaued at a lot higher level than it is now. Um, and I mean, really, if you look at this, this is not really so much a plateau as it is just a really kind of steady, gradual decline. Um, now, of course, like I said, you have to factor in things like how, you know, television viewing habits have changed and stuff like that. But still, this is not, you know, if you're if you're, you know, someone who's, uh, you know, on the money end of things with The Simpsons, you got to look at this and kind of be like, oh, well, you know, this is going to run out eventually. Also, consider, the, consider the back catalog, too. That's such a valuable. Oh, thing. God, yeah. If you go back and watch, I mean, it, so keeping it out there, it, it's for, it's on multiple fronts. Oh, I want to buy the fucking Simpsons merchandise. I want to have the DVDs or whatever, Blu-rays, because there's people that are like that. They just want the physical thing. And yeah, we live in digital times where you can have all this on, you know, on demand. But, you know, some people connect more with physical objects. So you have that uh, aspect of it as well. And like you said, viewing habits have changed. We don't necessarily know if less people are really are watching the Simpsons. We, just, we don't have the internal figures. Maybe just as many people, maybe 15 million people. A week are still watching The Simpsons. So how how can we really say that? You know, I, I think that's a very myopic view of it. Say, oh, look at the television ratings. When we know that the way content is consumed, especially with Zoomers and millennials, it's not necessarily like I'm going to sit in front of a television at eight at eight o'clock and watch that. That's not how it's done. People watch on phones. People watch on tablets. People watch all over the place. They watch on fucking gaming consoles. They, they binge watch it. it. Yeah, they watch it whenever the fuck they want. That's yeah, they the wait till the whole season's like, out and then binge the whole fucking thing. You know. Or listen to it in the background while they're cleaning their fucking there's house people, or something. There's people now that if every episode of a season is not out, they're not watching that show. I'm kind of like that. I'm kind of turning into that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I think that, I think it's safe to say that there's not as many people watching The Simpsons as there were in its heyday. But um, probably, you know, I mean, like this show, uh, the people who are watching still, um, they don't seem to be super invested in it. I mean, if you look at the IMDb's on these Simpson episodes. Not only is it kind of remarkable how low the ratings are, but it's kind of remarkable how few ratings there are per episode. Like the even the people who are watching this are more just casually, eh, whatever, The Simpsons. And there's a time when this show definitely commanded people's attention. And I think that, you know, if they want to have any hope of like salvaging it, um, I think they do need some kind of shake up like we were talking about. But failing that, I kind of just wish that they would just let it fucking die, you know? Um, I think one of the best metrics that we can use to at least infer yeah. how many people are still enjoying the Simpsons without, like Scotty said, having access to that internal data is just how little it gets brought up in common conversation. Right. Like when, when is the last time that you were having a conversation with somebody and they did an impersonation of one of these characters or quoted one of these characters? Um, you know, uh, you know, even when that does happen, and it has been a little while, but even when that does happen, they usually are referencing something earlier on in the show. And compare that to the quote unquote golden age of this show. Oh, where well, you couldn't even get through a conversation without someone right. fucking bringing I it up. A- Everybody I knew had, uh, you know, uh, an impersonation of one of these characters. Everybody I knew would reference one of these characters when it came to some event in their life. Uh, you know, everybody I knew had a Bart Simpson T-shirt. You know what I mean? And I, I don't even remember the last time I was out in public, period. But the last time I was out in public and saw somebody wearing a Homer Simpson hat or something, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's pretty rare. Like, I think that's a be- like the only metric that we can really look at. You, you, you know, in a way, it's kind of sad. But really, the last time I saw any excitement around The Simpsons was just the fact that when I went to Universal Studios and I was in The Simpsons part and people loved, oh, it's The Simpsons, I love it. They're taking pictures and shit. And I kind of realized, like, it's kind of like when you go to like an old city or something, you're like, this statue has been here for 300 years. And it's kind of like, wow, that's great. But then you kind of remember how people feel about history. It's something there's a passing interest in, but not, it's kind of more like to say you were there. 
The Simpsons. It's like the Simpsons. Like I like the Simpsons because it's, it's nostalgia. Totally- See, I had kind of a different take, and maybe this is just a, a virtue of you know my worldview versus yours, Scotty. But when we went to Universal together, all of us, yeah. it was stark to me going from the Harry Potter land in Universal, which was literally ass to ass on oh, Diagon yeah. Alley. I mean, you it was, the the excitement was palpable. Walking in the Simpsons land, it felt like a kind of a wasteland. They had these huge, giant, uh, you know, merch stores for The Simpsons with three or four people milling around in it. <laughs> yeah. oh. And the lines for The Simpsons rides and attractions were noticeably smaller than even, you know, like some of the other non Harry Potter stuff. It oh, just wow. it, it really underlined for me how, you know, I mean, yeah, there were still people there and I'm sure they were enjoying seeing the crazy Simpsons shit. But it was nowhere near the excitement level of uh, some of the other properties. Oh, oh, I completely agree with you. Comparing Harry Potter, I mean, that's really still in its prime and heyday. Uh, But, you know, I would say to that, when you went there, they hadn't fully fleshed it out. I'll definitely agree with you overall. I don't think, like, look, Harry Potter, the the Harry Potter section, Universal, by far the most popular. The Simpsons thing is, when I went there, was still pretty uh, happening. I, I, I definitely agree it's not to that level, but... They've expanded it. The, when I went there last time, all the rides were packed with people. There was people waiting two or three hours to ride the rides. Like the stores were packed out. It wasn't as though was it to the degree of Harry Potter. No, but there's still like a cultural nostalgia. I just don't think it's as, as relevant and fresh. So I don't think it's in people's minds as much. And, it, and obviously, people aren't dressing up like Simpsons characters, and you don't have all that going on. But I definitely agree with you. Like, could it be that if it had the same level of pop, if, if that happened in uh, 90, if they'd opened the, uh, that ninety seven, that's how it would have been. Yeah, oh, for yeah, sure, for sure, one hundred percent. And I still, I have a, maybe a slightly different view than either of you of uh, of you know sure. what I get out of it. And I kind of mentioned this before, but like to me, it just shows like I feel like there's still a genuine hunger for this to be good, and I feel like people are kind of starving for that. And I think that you know they're kind of still just kind of subsisting on the crumbs of uh, the nostalgia but that's kind of you know it's you know nostalgia you know it only lasts for so long at some point it starts to wane and at some point the people who are nostalgic for it get too old to even give a shit or they just get old and die and the new yeah, generation you know, doesn't give a anymore. fuck about it you know and it becomes like kind of like a, a an institution like mickey mouse like no one's waiting for the hot new fucking mickey mouse cartoon to fucking come out at this point you know what i mean Three-year-olds. I mean, he could still he could still sell you a you know he could still sell a fucking watch or a fucking alarm clock or fucking here's some dinner plates with Mickey Mouse on them or whatever the fuck. Uh, but you know, no one really gives a fuck about that character anymore. And I feel like the Simpsons are kind of heading down that path where it's almost like you know they have some kind of recognizable status as an institution in American culture and a revolutionary show that changed the fucking landscape of television at the time. You know, but and people appreciate that to whatever extent they're aware of it. But um, but you know, there's no there's no genuine excitement around it anymore. Yeah, it's just something that exists now. You know, it's just like it's there. It, it's there. You recognize it, but you don't really give a shit about it. It's just something that's been there for a while. And like you said, like it's it, like I was making the example of. It's like you're walking through a museum. Wow, look at this painting. It's great. And you move on. And that's how the Simpsons are. No one's, you know, you don't see much of fucking. The only people making memes about the Simpsons are the fucking boomers. They're like 65. Like, here's a Homer meme. That's still popular, isn't it? You know, you're out of touch with reality if you think this is what people are talking about. Uh, anyway, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, thank you guys for watching. We're going to be doing another Simpsons episode for the patrons. Uh, where we're going to be looking at some of the great characters from this show, uh, some of which you can see on the screen here. And uh, we're going to be talking kind of about uh, what those characters uh, mean and uh, why, and you know, just kind of talking overall about why this show is had such a great approach to character in its heyday. All right, so thank you for watching. Fuck off and die. Fight. 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 Fight.